How's it going? That is really hard. I'm not gonna lie, that is really hard. I've had to do so many takes of this chorale, uh, but I suppose that's what I get for trying chorales on guitar. So today's lesson, welcome back, my name's Juan Das, and uh, welcome back to a lesson. Here we're talking about Bach today and talking about Bach chorales. This is something I've been meaning to do for a while, but you know, I got caught up with construction of the building, allergies, it's been tough to find a slot. Seems to be a recurring theme in this building, but there's not much I can do about it. So I'm working with it as best as I can. But chorales are something that actually I started playing through one a few weeks ago. And this is something I do as a part of my practice. I wouldn't say I do it all the time and it's not religious, but every so often I like to open up some chorales and just start reading. Um, whether I end up learning it is a different story, but the lessons you can take from it and the little pieces and nuggets of information I think are just incredibly beneficial to, well, anyone who wants to learn about voice leading. Now, just as a note, I do want to just kind of go through this. If you see me looking over here, it's because I'm actually looking at the notation. This notation is available for free. I think it's on IMSLP. Just look up Bach Chorales, and it's the uh, it's in German, but it's the 389 chorales. It should have like a purple pink cover or something like that So if you want you can go check it out, but this is the actual vocal music. So Why do I work on chorales? Why is it a part of my practice routine? Especially because it's so annoying to play um, If you're playing all four voices and part of that is simply because I just like the music I think there are a lot of great melodies interwoven it's a great example of counterpoint, and if you want to improve your voice leading, this is paramount, if you want to improve your voice leading, you will inevitably find yourself reading Bach, and you'll find yourself reading that music. It's just kind of a given. Bach was a master of voice leading, a master of vocal writing. That's where a lot of this stuff comes from. So what you have to really consider is kind of, this is some of the essence of the music, an essence of voice leading, and it's a great answer looking like how do voices move, how do they work together, how do they, um, you know, function. Now, here's the thing, I want to make this very clear, you do not have to do all four voices. Um, I apparently try to do all four voices because I'm a crazy person. <laughs> but, you know, you can learn so much just by, let's say for example, I'm going to look at the first line and there are some beautiful movements in here. So for example, I look at the first line and I've just got just that alone. Beautiful writing. Wow, it's like everything in the neighborhood decided to just go off at the same time. But anyway, I'm gonna keep pushing through. Then moving on, check this out. Oh, sorry, C sharp. Then... Beautiful writing, just with two lines, and this is great just to learn on guitar. 
because what it does, the guitar by itself, when we're talking about counterpoint, the guitar is not great at four line counterpoint or three line. Well, three line is possible, but it's not the easiest thing in the world. Um, two line counterpoint is where the guitar works best. And you can see what Bach is doing is he's taking either block notes or he's got some suspensions going on. So he's holding Especially here, actually, it's the third, third measure of the first line, if you found this chart and you're following along. Um, and if you see me doing different fingerings, it's because I'm reading along. Of, this isn't rehearsed. Like, check out that octave. Uh, I missed that actually. And resolution's exactly where you expect it. It's great writing. That is what it is. And you know, you can do soprano, you can do different combinations. So you can do soprano alto or alto tenor or tenor bass. Tenor bass is a good one because you start seeing all of this in the lower voices, which is great for accompaniment. For example. My bass clef isn't great. Like, that's beautiful writing. You see how there's that contrary motion in the parts? Or, you can't really tell that way. Contrary motion in the parts. It's, it's just beautiful writing, and that's what it is. So that's one thing you can do with Bach. The thing is, this will help you with your counterpoint, but it'll also help you see how to resolve melodies. For example, even when I'm playing, you know, if I'm playing... <laughs> Like that. That was just a basic... Uh, like a rhythm changes. Some of this stuff can be found in Bach's music. It helps you learn just the basics of how to lead to a chord tone how to lead a phrase so that you land with confidence and conviction. So it's great stuff. But the other main reason I work on Bach and work on Bach chorales, and I'm just gonna do this because otherwise the video is gonna be like 20, 30 minutes just breaking down this whole thing. I like to take pieces of harmonic language and pieces of harmonic language so that I can use them and find new ways of just, you know, creating different pathways on the instrument. For example, one thing I saw when I was working through this, I found uh, it's a three-line piece. If you look at the score, it's three lines, or three systems, rather. And I found kind of like one or two ideas in each system, which I thought was really cool, that I thought would be really cool to use. So the first one was actually this uh, four, five, one. So we're in the key of, uh, at least, or rather, <laughs> Sorry, we're in the key of F. So then we see this movement. Right, so we see C major, D7 over F sharp, to G minor, and check this out. G minor, A7 over G. Like, that's beautiful. So then you can start taking these ideas and messing around with them. For example, like, if I just get that under my system, uh, or like if I make it easier to play and I don't have doubled voices, so I just take this. I've got E, G, and C instead of E, E, G, C, right? So I've got that. see where it's leading, suddenly just understanding that little idea opens something up. So, you know, take this in 12 keys, like that, that's in D minor, and you start finding these new ways of getting around the instrument, or even this. It's a beautiful piece of writing. Or 
or actually. So you see, suddenly I start branching out from that. That was towards the end of the phrase. Um, there was another, you know, little, little movements. You know, taking a major triad and then walking the root down to the seventh. Stuff that maybe I've played before, but I haven't looked at it in that detail. In the second line, there's a really beautiful movement, uh, start of the second line. Like, that's beautiful, it's just F major. And it's really, it then goes to a C major, if I'm gonna analyze this as a jazz musician. You know, F major, and then C major without the third. And then it resolves to A minor and then goes to F over it, F major seven over E, right? So then, just that alone is beautiful. And it's what I think really sells it for me is that common tone of the C that's just being held through the changes. Beautiful, just beautiful. Um, there was another little movement which I found challenging to play. Like, I, I still can't do that comfortably, and this ends up leading to uh, some of the challenges with Bach chorales for guitar. Um, especially on electric guitar, you know, one thing I was realizing as, as I was playing this, I couldn't control all the strings, and sometimes the strings would roll off the fretboard. That's just kind of the nature of the beast of electric guitar. You've got a slightly more curved radius than on a classical. so you have to figure out, how, you sometimes have to use extra energy to hold the string in place, which isn't ideal, but you know, you have to work around it. None of this, these movements aren't comfortable, and you know, it's hard to sometimes get these movements higher up on the instrument, so it's difficult. Now on the last line, this was actually something I shared on my stories like two, three weeks ago, because I, was just, I just found it beautiful. Check it out. I'm just going to do a very in-depth breakdown of this. So. In the top lines, we have this kind of little... If you just learned this alone from Bach, you would learn something incredibly beautiful. Seconds, suspended seconds resolving to thirds. So we've got minor second resolving to ma minor third. So then... Minor second, ma minor second, minor third. Major second, major third. Beautiful writing. Um, then and then resolving on the major third. We'd already modulated by this point. Now here's the cool thing. You don't have to add this in. You can either do it like this, but check this out. Like, that's beautiful if you just put it all together. Then, uh, bear with me, I'm reading bass and treble. Right? Beautiful writing. Um, and actually, one thing you'll find with Bach, at least how it translates to guitar, you've got a lot of close triads, close triads, and then you have a bass note. So it's either a lot of spread triads or close triads with bass note. Just remember that. It's a really cool thing to understand. Now, um, moving on from that, you've got... This one was one of my favorites. So F sharp diminished, going to D7, G7 over B, C minor, B diminished, going to G, G7. Really bizarre G7 voicing. But the reason, okay, why am I voicing it like this? Because I've got a movement from A flat to G, and well, you know, I can reach it. I'm trying to take advantage of my hands as well. So I, I don't recommend this, please. I, I said this on live streams, you know, take these chords with caution. I don't want someone to rip a tendon or something, and then, uh, you know, I'd feel really guilty if that happened. So take care of your hands. But I've got B, A flat, F, and D right? 
And because I wanted that smooth movement, that's why I'm voicing it like that. It would be much easier, well, not that much easier, but you could voice it like this. But I find there's more strain on the middle uh, between these two fingers here. You know, I could do that, but I'm looking for the smoothest sound possible. Major, major, right? So then if I put it all together, check out how this movement lines up. Right? And holding that note on top, it's beautiful. This one's familiar. F add nine to F. Bach was using all this stuff way before we were. And that nice harmonic rub between the D and the E flat. Then, um, where are we? Right, G minor. Then... And funnily enough, now how do we apply this? I, I know I said this was going to be trying to make it shorter, but I'm already approaching 20 minutes on this video. But, you know, there's just so much to talk about with this. I guess the important thing I want to close out on, how do we make this useful? How do we turn it into language? Well, start incorporating it, start playing it in different keys. You know, take some voicings that you like, like I love this one. Or just take that. Or take movements, take movements. For example, this. So five of five, let's say the, let's say the resolution is C minor, right? So we've got D7 flat nine, basically. So five of five, going to five, going to one minor. So then you can start messing around with that and change notes around. You know, for example, I found if you wanted a more modern voicing, let's say, let's say putting this in the jazz context where maybe the treatment of dissonances isn't as strict as in classical music. So you can do... Uh, and then C over E. Cool. See, that's a cool little sound. And you see how the sound has influenced me. Now this is kind of the next step. And what I would suggest, I'm probably going to dive deeper into this on Patreon, but I'm just going to give like a small hint of it here. Eventually, you know, I don't shed this and shed it and shed it and shed it so that I can pull it out at will. I would rather have the sound kind of permeate my playing so that I can try my best to improvise with this stuff. So movement... <laughs> have little pieces of vocabulary. this piece has influenced some of my melodic writing or melodic movement in an improv context. Direct quote of the material. Actually, that would be a cool one. Uh, So you see where I'm going with this. I'm trying to incorporate this as an improviser. And you know, this informs my writing as a composer. You can apply, I mean, it's written for voices, so it affects your vocal writing. You can treat this the same way as writing for strings. It's actually a really good thing to keep in mind. So there's a lot of information you can get out of this as a composer, as an improviser, and as a performer. So I hope this breakdown was really fun for you guys and just interesting. I wanted to share this. It's not so much a proper lesson like how Bach does this, rather how it translates to the instrument, you know, how it influences me as, as a musician and someone looking to really say something personal. How does this teach me? 
how does working through this material lead me to my own pathways? Because that's, I think, the thing that gets lost sometimes in education. We tend to just work on what's prescribed for us or what we prescribe for ourselves. And maybe sometimes we don't take it to where it could go. So I always say, even with stuff here on the YouTube channel, you know, don't take it as verbatim. Don't take it as a hard and fast rule. Experiment and try to find your own pathways and your own ideas. This is just information. It's something that'll help you find something else and maybe find a sound that's more personal to you. All right, I'm going to jump onto Patreon. Thanks so much for sticking around for this lesson. Um, I know it's been a bit of a long one, but finally got around to sharing this with you guys, and I look forward to seeing you in next week's video. Take care, and until then, I'll see you next time.